Chapter Seven of the Annals of Anne by Kate Trimble Sharber. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Being in love with Marcella weighed so on Julius's mind that he couldn't stay in New York but one week where the magazine is that he draws for. So he came back and has been here ever since, loving and drawing and sending them jobs by mail. Right away they set the wedding for the 11th of April, which seems like it never will come, me being in a big hurry for it. Poor Julius gets more and more delighted every day, talking a heap about what a happy home they're going to have, not realizing that Chopin and Dishpan didn't go together. He stays around and advises Marcella about her clothes and such like all day long. He says she reminds him of a narcissus being tall and creamy skinned so he wants all her dresses to be either white or light green the color of right young lettuce but she knows when really to take his advice and when just to make like she's taking it the way most ladies do with men why it would take a little pink milk sop like bertha parks to wear such colors as those she said behind his back one day but i don't think marcella better be calling bertha a milk sop just because she has to handle baby bottles all the time, for a person never can tell what might happen to them. One of the nicest things about the wedding is the bridesmaids. They consist of girls born partly here in the country, partly in the cities Marcella has visited and made friends with. The one I like best is Miss Cicely Reeves, though most people around here just call her Sis, being very small, with fluffy hair and cute ways and dimples. She has a good many lovers of different kinds, but don't seem to like one above another. She is a great hand to act romantic, such as falling in love with a man in a streetcar, or expecting her future husband to be a certain size and comb his hair a certain way, and things like that. This often keeps young ladies from getting married a long time, for mother says you oughtn't be too choice about size and hair, but I can't help being on that order myself. I do hope I can marry a man on a jet black charger named Sir Reginald de Beverley, who owns acres and acres of English landed gentry. Miss Sis had that experience with the name of Julius's best man. It happened that we were all sitting on the front steps one day when Julius pulled out a letter out of his pocket and told Marcella that he had just heard from Malcolm MacDonald and that he was going to be his best man. Who? asked Miss Sis right quick, looking up from the sprig of bridal wreath she was pulling the flowers off of. Julius told her the name over again, and then told her that he was a very old friend of his, and he was a fine civil engineer. I used to think a civil engineer was a polite man who ran the trains, but I know now he is a man that gets in the middle of the street with a string and a three-legged thing and measures the road. Is he married? Miss Sis asked a heap quicker than she had asked who no and not likely to be julius answered still looking over the letter absent-mindedly the name sounds good miss sis commenced her eyes sparkling i've never heard anything scotchier something tells me he must be my ideal then something must be telling you a lie julius said laughing for he couldn't be any woman's ideal he is very real an old bachelor thirty-seven years stern and precise and he considers every woman on earth as a frivolous and unnecessary evil the kind of man i adore miss sis said joyfully though anybody that knew her well could tell she was fooling my life will be a blank until he comes it would be a blankety blank if you had to live with him for you are the kind of woman to torment such a man to death all the more reason for his falling in love with me as I have fallen in love with his name, and if he doesn't, I shall consider him a very uncivil engineer. Which was just her way of talking. This happened fully two months ago, but they've talked about it off and on ever since, and now he is coming to stay with Julius till the wedding, to cheer him up, I suppose. Sure enough, he did come today, although lots of times I imagine that I will never get to see a person I've heard spoken of so often and in such high tones, and sometimes I wish I hadn't. But it wasn't that way with Mr. MacDonald. Nobody on earth could have been disappointed in him, for he is one of the tallest gentlemen I ever saw with trousers so smoothly creased that they look like somebody had ironed them after he put them on. He takes his own time about saying things, 
being very careful about saying of whom and by which, like the grammar tells you to. Julius brought him over to Marcella's this afternoon so he could be making friends with her and the bridesmaids that were collected there. Remembering how they'd been teasing Miss Sis about him, I kept my eye on her from the minute he walked through the door. I was greatly disappointed, though, for she never seemed to notice him. I guess she took a better look at him than I imagined, though, for the minute they were gone she jumped clear across the room to where Marcella was standing and grabbed her and danced up and down. Isn't he beautiful? she said, all out of breath. I'm just crazy about him. Did you ever see such Gibsony feet and legs in your life? Which mortified her mother, it being impolite to mention feet and legs in her days. Julius is romantic, too, for a man, and says he doesn't want any flowers used in connection with his wedding except the sweet, early spring ones that favor Marcella so much. We have a yard full of them, and so Mother told them this morning that they better come over and gather them, knowing that young folks enjoy picking flowers together, and they will stay fresh for several days if you put a little salt in the water. It was the most beautiful morning you ever saw, with birds and peach blossoms and the smell of plowed ground all making curious feelings inside of you. Marcella, being a musician, noticed the birds, and Julius, being an artist, noticed the peach blossoms. But Mr. MacDonald, being just a man, noticed Miss Sis. She would walk along without noticing him and take a seat in the farthest corner away from him. But anyhow, she seemed to do the work, which taught me a lesson. That if you're trying to get a man to notice you, it's the best plan not to notice them, except when they ain't looking. They sat down on the porch and rested a while after they came, while the Narcissuses, Narcissi they called them, which sounds stuck up to me, smelled very sweet from the yard. Julius remarked he wished they had made Rufy come along with them so he could have said poetry out of Keats, as it was just the kind of day to make you feel Keatsy. And pretty soon he and Marcella got on to their favorite subject, the ruby yacht, which they say is a piece of poetry from Persia. They talked and talked, which made me very sleepy and pretty soon I noticed that Mr. MacDonald was getting sleepy, too. He leaned over to Miss Sis and said, kinder whispery, I don't understand poetry, do you? No, I don't, she answered back with a smile on her face, which I knew she meant to be congenial. I knew this was a story, for she talks about the ruby yacht as much as anybody when he ain't around, but I didn't blame her for telling one in a case like this. I never could discover what the deuced ruby yacht was about in the first place, he said. Looks like from the names, I said, speaking up, that it would be about a red ship. But before I could get any further, they began to laugh and tell my remark to Julius and Marcella, which was mortifying. This broke up the poetry talk, and they began gathering the flowers. Miss Sis and Mr. MacDonald picking in pairs, by which I knew they were getting affinityfied. After they had picked till their backs were tired, Mammy Lou came out on the porch bringing a waiter with some of her best white cake and a bottle of her year-before-last-before-that's wine sitting on it and her finest ruffled cap, very proud. She was curious to see the young man Miss Sis was settin' up to, to see whether the match was a fittin' one or not. She took a good look at him, then called Miss Sis into the hall to speak her opinion. He'll do, I heard her say, while Miss Sis was telling her to, Shh, Mr. MacDonald would hear her. He'll do, Mammy kept on, not paying any attention to what was told her, like she always don't. He must be all right for being a friend of Mr. Julius's would pass him. But, honey, he is tolerable po-faced, which ain't no good sign in Marion. If thar's anybody better experienced in that business than me and King Solomon, I'd like to see the whites of their eyes. And I tell you every time, if you want to get a good-natured, wood-cutting, baby-tending husband, choose one that's fat in the face. A good many wedding presents commenced to coming in this morning, which was a sign that the invitations got to the people all right. You often hear of things being worth their weight in silver, but there's one thing you can count on it's being true about, and that is wedding invitations. You never saw such delighted people as Julius and Marcella. They were laid out on tables in the parlor and greatly admired. 
they're ours dearest he said squeezing her hand right before everybody yours and mine our lairs and penates this greatly impressed me and i looked it up in the back of the dictionary when i got home which is a very useful place to find strange words it said lares et penates household gods which didn't make sense so i knew the dictionary man must have made a mistake and meant to say household goods gentlemen said mammy lou when i told the words to her if he thinks up such names as them for his furniture what will he do when he gets his chillin this remark seemed to put an idea into her head for lovey mammy's other daughter besides dilsey has got a pair of two little twins that have been going around for the last five years in need of a name just because mammy lou and ike their father can't ever agree on one a name or anything else them's the very names for the little angels mammy said washing the dinner dishes deep in thought for the twins being boys and girls the names being able to accommodate themselves to airy sex proves that they're the very thing she studied over it for a good while i guess on the account of ike although mammy is usually what she calls very plain spoken with him a plain spoken person is one that says nasty things to your face and expects you not to get mad when they say them behind your back they're diplomatic but finally she started off to name them and having had so much trouble already with ike i saw her slip her heavy soled slippers into her pocket before she started she stayed away a long long time but when she got back she held her head so high and acted so stuck up that i just knew she had got to use both the names and the slippers did you name em i asked her going to the kitchen to get some tea cakes supper being very late did i she answered back cutting out the biscuits with a haughty look you just oughter saw me namin em which did you name which i named the precious boy penates because i most know those common niggers round here'll shorten it to peanuts which would be hurtin to a little girl's feelings well i said continuing to show a friendly interest ain't you glad they're named at last so if they die you could have a tombstone for em glad she answered putting the biscuits in the pan but her mind still on the twins and sticking holes in the top of them with a fork glad ain't no name for it why ain't I had as much enjoyment out of nothing as i had out of this namin since the night i married bill williams it's a very thrilling and exciting thing to be a bride and if you can't be a bride you can still manage to get a good many thrills out of just a bridesmaid all of marcella's have talked about how nervous and timid they're going to be when the men are around and some say they nearly faint when a great crowd stares at them others say they bet folks will think they've got st vitus's dance from trembling so anyhow they're all very modest but miss sis i believe ain't puttin on for all she claimed toward modestness is that her knees get so weak that they nearly let her drop when she acts a bridesmaid which is the way a good many persons feel the maids have laughed a good deal over her knees among themselves never dreaming that the men would catch on to them but they did in the following manner miss sis stayed all night at marcella's last night to tell secrets for the last time for after a lady is married you can't be too careful about telling her your secrets and early this morning i ran over and saw her dressed in a pretty blue kimono which set off her good looks greatly down by the woodpile which they keep in the side yard there's a hedge of honeysuckle which runs between the gardens and the yard and she appeared to be searching on the ground for something close to the hedge i went up to where she was admiring her company and she smiled when she saw me and she said very pleasantly can you help me find two nice little smooth thin boards i complimented her on her kimono and said yes m to the board question and then asked her what she wanted with them my knees she answered laughing they're so idiotic that when i get excited they threaten to let me drop if i could strap two nice little boards to them at the back you know it would prop them up and be such a help you couldn't walk very good i told her but she said oh yes she could and to prove it she commenced whistling the wedding march and walking stiff-kneed away from the woodpile to the tune of it 
She looked so funny that I started to laugh when just then I heard another laugh on the other side of the honeysuckle vines. I found a place where I could peep through and saw it was Julius and Mr. MacDonald who had come out to view Mr. Claiborne's hotbeds and greatly complimenting them, Julius knowing that it's a fine thing to stay on the good side of your father-in-law in case you lose your job. I knew they heard what Miss Sis had said, for they were laughing very hard, which caused Mr. MacDonald to look real young, being as his eyes can twinkle. I knew it would be mortifying for her to see that they had heard her, so I hollered and told her that I heard Marcella calling her from the upstairs window, so she ran right on in without coming back to the woodpile. I started to go on after her, but just as I got to the kitchen door, I remembered that I had left my pretty white sunbonnet that Mammy Lou had freshly ironed for me on the woodpile and ran back to get it. Julius and Mr. MacDonald were right where they were only looking in the other direction and talking very seriously, so I stayed a minute out of friendly interest. Although so bright and amusing, she is never silly, I heard Mr. MacDonald's long, slow voice saying. She is a very lovely, fascinating little woman. So I took a seat on the woodpile. You'd better fall in love with her, Julius said, cutting the briars off of a long switch he held in his hand and talking careless-like as if he wasn't paying much attention. Your advice comes too late, Mr. MacDonald said, his voice so solemn that Julius looked up in surprise. What? Julius remarked. Yes, Mr. MacDonald said, sounding very devoted. I did that very thing the first moment I looked at her dear sweet face. Julius stared at him a minute, and then laughed a tickled laugh and I moved my seat right up to the hedge so I could get a good look at them, and it was the next best thing to a proposal. That's the funniest thing I've ever heard of, Julius said after he had quit laughing. It's devilish funny to you, poor Mr. MacDonald said, looking like he didn't know whether to laugh or to cry. But what am I to do? Do, said Julius, very businesslike, like folks talk when they're telling you to follow their example. What do men in your situation usually do? Why, well, propose to her. But she'd never marry me, he said, looking right pitiful, for he spoke as humble as if he wasn't any taller than me, and him over six feet tall. It would be the most absurd thing in the world for a man like me to propose to a woman like her. No, you're wrong, Julius told him, still half laughing. The most absurd thing would be that she would accept you. I'm awfully tired tonight, and it would cramp my hand nearly to death to write all about the wedding, how Julius looked happy up to the last, and how Marcella cried just enough to appear ladylike on her lace handkerchief, and how the family relatives cried a little too. Weddings are all alike, but proposals are all different, and I think I better use more space on them in my diary, so my grandchildren won't get sleepy over the sameness. But it would be a waste of handwriting to tell how Miss Sis tormented poor Mr. MacDonald all day, making him chase around after her trying to get in a private, loving word, and me just crazy to see whether she really was going to accept him or not, although I might have known. He followed her up, though, looking so brave and determined that he reminded me of the boy stood on the burning deck. She worried him so that all through the ceremony he looked so pale and troubled that you'd have thought it was him getting married. Finally, just before it was time for the train that he was going back to town on to blow, she changed about and commenced acting sweet. All this was nice enough to watch, but is a crampin' to write about. And anyhow, the main thing with me was to see whether she was going to accept him or not. I stayed close to their heels all day but he didn't get a chance to propose until just after dark, down by the front gate, with nobody around except me and a calicanthus bush, and, well, you just ought to have seen her accepting him. End of chapter 7 Read by C.J. Ploeg Chapter 8 of The Annals of Anne by Kate Trimble Sharper this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Ever since my last birthday, there has been a great change come over me, 
for I have not kept my diary. Mother took me to one side that morning and said it was time for me to act like I was growing up now. She said many a girl as big as me could pick a chicken and I couldn't do a thing but write a diary and would even run and stop up my ears every time Mammy Lou started to wring one's head off. She said all the ladies of the neighborhood nearly worried her to death advising her to teach me how to work and saying it was simply ridiculous for a great big girl like me to lie flat on her stomach reading a book all day in the grass. This shows how I am misunderstood by my family and I told mother so but she said for goodness sake not to get that idea into my head for girls that were always complaining about being misunderstood were the kind that got divorces from their husbands afterwards i know this won't be the way with me though for i expect to live on good terms with sir reginald always wearing pink satin and spangles even around the castle and never getting mussy looking when i give the children a bath in hopes of retaining his affections like they tell you to in ladies magazines but i didn't mention sir reginald to mother or she would have misunderstood me worse than ever goodness i reckon the neighbors would have a fit if they could see me of a night when i dress up and step out on the porch roof making like i'm juliet and shakespeare i wear a lace thing over my head and let a pair of cousin eunice's last year's bedroom slippers represent romeo with fur around the top they are the kind he wore the night they took me to see him and are all i can find in the house that looks at all like him nobody gets to see me doing this though for i lock the door somehow i think it would be a nicer world if you could always lock the door on your advising friends last summer rufie said i was so clever for my age he said that i ought to be in the city i like this kind of advice at a good school so father and mother decided to move to the city and take mammy lou and spend the winter and all the other winters until i could get educated and live in a flat so we went me writing much sorry poetry about leaving my old home the older i get the more i think of poetry and i reckon by the time i'm engaged i'll be crazy about it our leaving was very sad poor little lairs and panades cried so hard at the depot where they went to tell mammy lou good-bye that a drummer who was traveling with a kind heart gave them a quarter apiece to hush i never admired the name of flat from the first and when we started to rent one i admired it less than ever it consists of a very large house divided up and no place to kill a chicken there is also no place to warm your feet nor to pop corn in fact there are more places where you can't do things than where you can rufi took us to every one in town nearly and mammy paid particular attention to how the kitchens were fixed and asked what become of the potato peelings with no pigs to eat them up finally after everything had been explained to her she spoke up in the midst of a lady's flat with tears in her eyes and said miss mary let's go back to the country where slop is called slop and here it's garbage father and mother were both delighted that going back had been mentioned without either of them saying it first for both of their feet were sore from looking for flats and they liked to have fallen over each other in agreeing with mammy god never intended for human beings to live in flats father said after the elevator had put us down on dry land once more drawing a deep breath nor in cities either rufi agreed with a faraway look in his eyes like he might be thinking of the chestnut hunts and the black haws of his boyhood that night they said well they had found out they couldn't live in the city and they weren't going to be separated from me and i had to be educated so rufi then told them that a governess was the next best thing this sounded so much like a young girl in a book that at first i was delighted a governess is a very clean person that always expects you to be the same only in books they are usually drab colored young ladies without any nice clothes or parents but the son of the family falls in love with them much to their surprise and they lose their job then the son gets sent away to india with his regiment where he hopes he can meet sweet death through a bullet hole this is the way they are in books mine though is not anything like that being very pretty and pink and with a regular father and mother like other folks have 
but there is a great mystery connected with her don't anybody but me know about it and i don't know all about it from the very first she seemed to have something on her mind this is very unusual for a young girl so i tried to find out what the cause of it was one day at the dinner table when she had been here about two weeks father remarked that i was learning faster from her than i ever had and he hoped that she would stay here with us until i was finished being educated and not be wanting to get married like most young ladies miss wilburn instead of laughing as one would expect turned red in the face her first name is louise and she said something that sounded like oh no mammy who was in the room at the time spoke up as she usually does and said well there must be something wrong with her if she didn't want to marry as all right-minded women married once and extra smart ones married as often as there was any occasion to instead of smiling miss wilburn looked more painful than ever so mammy who thinks enough of her to even do up her shirt waists changed the subject that night when i went into the kitchen to talk to mammy during the cooking her mind was still on the subject of miss wilburn and marrying honey she said to me flipping over the cakes with great conviction i've been thinking it over and the long and short of it is that that poor child's been fooled i know them symptoms she's been fooled and she's grieving over it though there ain't no use for women to grieve over nary one man so long as she's under forty and got good front teeth i said oh i hoped not i hated to think about the lover of my governess proving false i told mammy maybe he had just died or something else he couldn't help but she interrupted me died nothing that ain't no excuse for thar's all this time to marry no matter what you're fixin to do there ain't no excuse for not marrying in this world she kept on be it male or female you needn't be sottin thar swingin your legs and arguin with me about the holy estate the very first minute i thought there was anything of a loving nature connected with miss wilburn i got out my diary to write it down as you see she had told mother anyhow to let me keep it as it would stimulate my mental faculties and they would never be able to make a chicken pickin person out of me i'm going to keep it right here in the drawer and jot down everything i see although i am convinced that the lover is dead julius and marcella are down here now for the first time since they were married we see them a great deal for they love to go walking through the woods with miss wilburn and me but i can't waste my diary writing about them now i just happened to think what a pity it was that i didn't try to find out the mystery about miss wilburn from rufie and cousin eunice when we was up there last summer for they knew her real well before we got her in fact for the first few days she and i didn't have any congenial things to talk about except them and tiny waterloo waterloo's little name by rights is rufus claiborne jr and he occurred at a time when i wasn't keeping my diary but my grandchildren would have known about him anyhow he being their little fifth cousin he is very different from bertha's baby for he is a boy i thought when i first saw him that if there was anything sweeter in this world than a girl baby it was a boy one rufi and cousin eunice have lately been kinder new thought persons which think if you have poise enough there can't anything on earth conquer you rufi bragged particularly about nothing being able to conquer him or get him in a bad temper he had so much poise but when little rufus was just three nights old and he had walked him the other two and he was still squalling he threw up his job poise be hanged cousin eunice told us he said i've met my waterloo and they've called him that ever since when we were up there this summer waterloo was giving his father considerable trouble about the editorials an editorial is a smart remark opposite the society column and rufi couldn't think up smart things while he was squalling oh for a desert island he said one night when he was awful busy and couldn't get anything done oh for a mammoth haystack where i might thrust my head to drown the noise i've read that jean jacques rousseau used to do so listen i've made a rhyme 
tis not rhymes but dimes we need most just now so go on with your work cousin eunice said gathering waterloo together to take him upstairs merely removing the location of the noise will lessen it but slightly rufe called to her as she got to the door seriously do you know of a hayloft in the neighborhood where i might go you might go next door to the williams's garage and thrust your head into their can of gasoline that's the latter-day equivalent for hay cousin eunice answered kinder mad for she admires waterloo no matter how he acts so miss wilburn and i talked over all we knew about the little fellow and i thought what a mistake i'd made in not asking cousin eunice what miss wilburn's lover's name was and where he is buried and a few other things like that but then i couldn't because i didn't know that there was a lover still mammy lou can talk till her hair turns straight and she won't get me to believe that he's anything else but dead everything seems to point to it from the fact of her not getting any letters from young men and looking lonesome at times and not wearing any diamond engagement ring i'm sure he gave her one but maybe his wicked kinfolks made her give it back to them after the funeral or maybe she buried it in his grave i don't know why miss wilburn never talks about him for one of our neighbors talks all the time about her husband which was killed in the war i used to be delighted to hear her commence telling about him he was killed at the battle of shiloh and was the tallest and handsomest man in the army she takes a great deal of pleasure in talking about him and when there are summer boarders at her house he grows to be nearly seven feet tall and so handsome that it hurts your eyes to look at him her second husband is stone deaf and can't hear it thunder which makes it nicer for them for while it amuses her to talk about her first husband's good looks it ain't hurtin to the second one's feelings the autumn leaves are just lovely now and make you want to write a book or at least a piece of poetry it's right hard on you though not having anything to write about but a girl without a bow it's kinder like eating sweet potatoes without butter i decided this morning that i better make the most out of what i've got as a subject so i started to writing one called the maiden widow i've heard of a book by that name but i don't reckon they'll have me arrested for writing just a short poem by the same name we have some nature study every morning in the woods which is one of the best things about having a governess she lets me do just as i like so i took my tablet and while she was writing some history questions i composed my poem it was a very discouraging work though to write about widows for there's nothing on earth that will rhyme with them i got one line the maiden widow she wept she ditto which was sorry enough sounding but i didn't know whether or not it was exactly fair to have two words rhyming with just one after a while i thought maybe a regular poet could do a better job by it than i ever could so i decided to ask marcella to ask julius to write me a few lines as a copy to go by for anybody that can draw such lovely pictures ought to be able to write poetry marcella came over this afternoon and i took her upstairs very secretly to ask her about it she said why what on earth made me think that miss wilburn was grieving over a dead lover and i told her that everything made me think it after studying about it for a little while she said well it might be that i was right for the girl did seem to have something preying on her mind but she said such subjects were not suitable for children of my age to be writing about and that i ought to write about violets and sparrows i said then would she please find out from julius whether or not there was a rhyme for widow for i might want to write a poem on them when i got grown but she said anne you are incorrigible which i keep forgetting to look up in the dictionary although it looks like i would for it has been said to me so many times a thing happened this morning which made me understand what shakespeare must have meant when he said much ado about nothing it reminded me of the time cousin eunice rushed to the telephone and called rufe up and said oh dearest the baby's got a tooth this was harmless enough in itself but it is when things are misunderstood that the trouble comes in rufe misunderstood and thought she said the baby's got the croup which is very dangerous so he didn't stop to hear another word but dropped the telephone and grabbed his hat it was night for rufe's paper is a morning one 
that works its men at night and didn't wait for a car but jumped into a carriage which costs like smoke he drove by dr gordon's house and told the driver to run in and tell dr gordon to come right on and drive to his house with him as his baby was very sick although dr gordon has an automobile of his own he and ann lisbeth happened to have a few friends in to play cards with them that night but when she heard the news about the baby she told the company that cousin eunice was one of the best friends she had in the world and she would have to go on over and see if she could help any so the card party was broken up and they all drove as hard as they could tear over to rufie's house where they found cousin eunice tickled to death over the tooth and washing waterloo's little mouth out with boric acid water which is the proper thing this is what i call much ado about nothing and i'm sure shakespeare would if he was living today what happened this morning was equally as exciting and a long story so i'm going to stop and sharpen my pencil for i despise to write exciting things with a pencil that won't half write i reckon some people might lay the blame on me for what happened but it ain't so at all if people hadn't just misunderstood me anyhow it may make me curb my imagination as julius says for that is what they blamed it all on when we started out for our nature study this morning father said if we could stand the sight of human nature a little would we go downtown right after train time and get the mail well we said yes and marcella who was with us said she would be glad to go in that direction for julius was there and we could meet him and he would walk home with us she still likes to see him every few minutes in the day there are usually several very handsome drummers and insurance men and things like that standing around the post office which have just got off the train at this hour but this morning there wasn't anybody but one strange man and he was talking to julius like he knew him when we passed by julius spoke to us and i noticed that the strange man looked at miss wilburn and looked surprised all in a minute i thought maybe he was the lover which had just returned from some foreign shore instead of being dead and would run up with open hands and say louise and she would say marmaduke and all would be well i learned afterward though that his name is mr white and he lives in the city and has come down here on business and knew julius after we had passed he remarked that he was surprised to see miss wilburn down here as he didn't know she was away from home julius asked him if he knew miss wilburn and he said no but he knew paul crichton the fellow she was going to marry mighty well julius instead of not saying anything as a person ought spoke up and said why he understood that miss wilburn's sweetheart was dead the strange man said why he was utterly shocked for he had seen crichton on the streets only a few days before but he had looked kinder pale and worried then he said it made him feel weak in the knees to hear such a thing and julius commenced saying something about it must be a mistake then but mr white said no he guessed it was so for mr crichton had looked awful pale and thin like he might be going into consumption julius said well he was certain his wife had told him something about miss wilburn having a dead lover but he hadn't paid much attention to what she was saying like most married men but it surely couldn't be so by that time mr white was moving down the street to where we were and was asking julius to introduce him to miss wilburn so he could find out the particulars about poor old crichton i will give julius credit for trying to stop him but he is one kind of a person that never knows when to say a thing and when not to mr white i mean and before julius could get him sidetracked they had caught up with us and there wasn't anything else to do but introduce him miss wilburn smiled very joyfully when she heard his name and in a minute he had got her off to one side and i heard him saying something about how horrified he was to hear the news about poor crichton in just an instant miss wilburn was the one that looked horrified and she said why what this seemed to bring mr white's to his right mind a little and instead of going ahead and telling it he turned around to julius and said why our friend young here was telling me that i told you 
that it must be a mistake julia spoke up looking awfully uncomfortable but i remember my wife saying that oh say marcella explain will you why julius young marcella commenced in a married lady tone you promised me that you wouldn't say a word about it anyway we only suspected will nobody tell me what has happened to paul miss wilburn said in a low strangled voice like she couldn't get her breath good ain't anything happened to him that we know of i told her for julius and the rest of them looked like they were speechless we thought you knew it knew what oh for the love of heaven tell me she said poor thing and i felt awful sorry for us all but for miss wilburn and me in particular i just couldn't tell her we thought he was plumb dead so i told her we thought he must be very sick or something he may be she answered not looking any happier i haven't heard from him since i've been here oh it serves me right for acting like such an idiot as to run off down here and forbid his writing to me he may be desperately ill how did you hear it ain't anybody heard it yet i told her feeling so angry at marcella and julius and mr white for telling such a thing and so ashamed of myself for making it up that i couldn't think very well i kept wishing in my mind that it was the first day of april so i could say april fool or an earthquake would happen or anything else to pass it off but didn't anything happen so i had to stand there with all of them looking at me and tell miss wilburn how mammy lou said she believed she had been fooled because she looked so sad at the mention of marrying but i believed the gentleman was dead well it took every one of us every step of the way home to explain it to her and to each other each one of us talking as hard as we could and julius remarked what he'd do the next time he heard any such sewing society tales under his breath just as we got in sight of the house poor miss wilburn was so worn out with grief and anxiety that she sat down on the big stump and laughed and cried as hard as she could mother saw her from the window and she and mammy ran down to where we were to see what it was all about she patted miss wilburn on the back and on the head and said poor dear while mammy said she would run right back to the house and brew her some strong tea which was splendid when a body was distressed about a man there dear talk to us about him mother said after the whole story was told tell us about him for talking will do you good you've been unnaturally quiet about him since you've been here i was trying to find out whether or not i really loved him miss wilburn said after julius and marcella had left us and we were going on up the walk it was silly of me for all the time i've been so lonesome for him that i felt as if i should scream if anybody suggested men or marrying to me yes you poor lamb mammy said walking on fast to make the tea you loves him you show do i knows them symptoms End of chapter 8. Read by C.J. Plogue. Chapter 9 of The Annals of Anne by Kate Trimble Sharper. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. I think if the person which remarked it as not always May had said April, he would have come nearer hitting it, for I think it's the most beautiful time of all there's something in the very feelings at this time of the year that makes you want to write pretty things whether you know what you want to say or not so i've got out my diary and dusted it off it being laid away in the drawer ever since last fall when i told about me getting miss wilburn's affairs so mixed up because there hasn't been anything happening one time not long ago i did get out my diary for i got very excited over the news that a widow was here and i sharpened seventeen pencils so as to be ready for her but she had the misfortune to marry before i could get introduced to her a man from her same city which had got on the train and followed her down here she was a lovely high-heeled fluffy petticoated kind of a widow and i could have written chapters out of her i know because all the time she was down here the ladies sewing circle met three times a week and talked so that father said he heard they had to pass around potash tablets instead of refreshments for the sake of their sore throats mammy lou made fun of me when i told her how disappointed i was over not getting to meet such a pretty lady 
and write her experiences. Looks like you'd a know better than to expect a widow to waste time a cotin, she told me with that proud look coming over her face that always does when she begins to brag on herself. They don't co it. They marries. There ain't nobody able to dispute with me over the ways o widows, for ain't I been six of them myself? This ain't exactly so. It's just five, for she never has got that divorce from Bill Williams yet, and she says now that she's going to spend the money that the divorce would cost in beautifying herself so she can marry again. She says she wants to buy her a stylish set of bangs and a pair of kid gloves to go with them. Then she's going to let the next man make her a present of the divorce for a bridal gift. And you needn't be setting it down in that little dairy book o' yarn neither, for your grandchildren to be making a sport o' me about after I'm dead and gone. I told her it was a diary, not dairy. But she wouldn't listen to me. Go long with that stuck up talk, she told me. Ain't I been knowing about dairies all my life? and I never even heard tell of a diary till I learned to my sorrow of that pesky little book that's always getting lost and me having to find it. And I couldn't blame her very much for this, me being a great hand myself to get words mixed up in my childhood, especially such words as epistle and apostle. I always thought that ignorant people said epistle, and smart ones apostle. But, as I was saying, a sweetheart is the proper thing to get in the spring, if you can get one. But if you're too little for such a thing, a kindred spirit is the next best thing a girl can have. A kindred spirit is a girl you lay awake till twelve o'clock of a night telling secrets to. Of course, men never tell secrets, but they often need a kindred spirit, that is, a close friend, especially when they get so sick they think they're about to die. They want the friend to run quick to their private office and burn up some letters in their desk that it wouldn't be healthy for them to let their wife know about, even if they were dead. So, it is a convenient thing to have male or female. The first night I laid awake with mine, I told her all about stuffing my insteps to make them look aristocratic and kissing Lord Byron's picture good night every night, which I never would have done in the daylight. At night, things just seem to tell themselves, although you are very sorry for it the next day. Men mostly propose at night. I guess one excuse is that the girls form such beautiful optical illusions under a pink lampshade. Well, I told her all I knew, and she told me the story of her life, which is as follows. Her name is Jean Everett. Her mother's name is Mrs. Everett and her young lady aunt is named Miss Merrill Arnold on her mother's side. They are down here to spend the summer and are boarding close to our house. There's another boarder in the house for the summer which is named Mr. St. John, and Jean says if they had named him Angel instead of just Saint, it wouldn't be any too good for him. And if I do say it myself, he is as beautiful as a mermaid, Mammy Lou says he's got a consumpted look, but to other people it is the height of poetry. Jean is so full of poetical thoughts herself that her stomach is very much upset and nothing but chocolate candy will agree with her. She has promised the next time she stays all night with me she will tell me the one great secret of her life. As if I hadn't guessed it the minute she called Mr. St. John's name. She hasn't got much appetite, and the smell of honeysuckle fills her with strange longings. She says she either wants to write a great book, or live in a marble palace, or marry a duke. She can't tell exactly which. But the poor girl is cruelly misunderstood by her family, because her mother is giving her rhubarb to break it out on her. Jean came over early this morning and said she just had to talk to somebody about how spiritual Mr. St. John looked last night with his fair hair and white vest on. He looked just like a lily, Anne, she said, with almost tears in her eyes, and me, remembering Dr. Gordon, didn't laugh at her. Then, before I could comfort her, she had dropped down by the iris bed and was telling me the one great secret of her life, without waiting to stay all night and tell it in the moonlight. Love him, she said gathering up a handful of purple irises. Love him? I'd cook for that man. 
I didn't hardly know what to say in answer to this secret, which wasn't much of a secret to me. But she didn't wait for me to say anything, for she went on telling me what big pearl buttons the white vest had on it, and how Mr. St. John said, Hither, and Nither, and how broken her heart was. She said she was the most sinful girl on earth, for she believed Mr. St. John was about to get struck on her Aunt Merle, and here she was winning him away from her. I asked her if he had ever said anything about loving her, and she said, Why, no. No well behaved girl would let a man say such a thing to her until they had been acquainted at least a month, and they hadn't been knowing each other but twenty two days. I then asked her, if he had made any sign that he would like to say things to her when the month was out. But she said that was just where the trouble came in. She knew she could win his love if she once got a chance at him. But no matter how early she got up of a morning to go and sit with him on the porch before breakfast, which was a habit of his, he would just ask her how far along she was in geography, and if she didn't think algebra was easier than arithmetic and such insulting questions as that. Then he would pace up and down the floor until her Aunt Merle came out the front door, acting like a caged bridegroom. She said, oh, it would put her in her grave if she didn't get her mind off of it for a little while. Then she asked me if we were going to have strawberries for dinner, and she said she would run over and ask her mother if she could stay. This morning, Jean asked me if I remembered what Hamlet in Shakespeare said about words. I told her I had just got as far as the Merchant of Venice and was getting ready to start on Hamlet when Miss Wilburn left. She said, well, he remarked, words, 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 but he didn't know what he was talking about. She said he meant that there wasn't anything in mere words, but he was badly fooled for there was a heap in them. I told her, Yes, there was something in words, for I had read of a beautiful Irish poet once that just couldn't think of a word that he wanted to finish up a song with. He studied it over for about three months when all of a sudden one day his carriage upset and bumped his head so hard that he thought of it. Jean said that was a beautiful story and she would be willing to have her head bumped once for every word if she could just write poetry that would touch one cold heart that she knew of. I said, well, how on earth did all this talk about words come up? And she told me that all her future happiness depended on the meaning of just one word. Then she went on to tell me that this morning she had seen her Aunt Merle on the porch talking to Mr. St. John. So she slipped around to the end of the porch like I showed her how to do when there was anything interesting going on. And she had heard him tell Miss Merle that she mustn't condemn the precipitation but rather consider how he could do otherwise. Then he had made use of a word that she never heard of before in her life. It was propinquity, and Miss Merle's face had turned as red as tomatoes when he said it. She said if it was a love word, she was ready to commit suicide of a broken heart. But if it was a hateful word, and they were quarreling, then there was great hopes for her. We looked it up but the dictionary man didn't explain it hardly a bit. Finally, I told Jean, as it was spelled so much like iniquity, maybe they meant the same thing, and she went home feeling much easier in her mind. I'm in such a writable mood tonight that I don't know what to begin on. I reckon I'll know less about where to stop. Mamie Lou started us at it, for her mind never runs on a thing except loving and marrying. She asked me early this morning if we wasn't going to try our fortunes today by looking down into a well at noon, this being May Day. Me, being of an affectionate nature, of course liked the idea, so I ran right over to tell Jean, who was simply carried away. She said it would be such a relief to her to see the face of her beloved reflected in the well. But I told her that to see any face would mean that she was going to get a husband which a girl ought to be thankful for and not get her heart set on any particular one. While we were planning about it, Miss Merle came in and asked what it was. When we told her, she smiled and asked if she was too old and grown up to join in the game. But I told her no, indeed. 
she didn't act at all like a grown person. I really think Miss Merle is very fascinating. Even her name, Merle, sounds soft and sweet to me, like a right fresh marshmallow. Now, naturally, anybody would be excited to think that they were going to see their husband's face at twelve o'clock in the bottom of a well, and it seemed to us that the time would never come. There is a very old well down in our pasture close by the fence, which ain't covered over, and a lot of lilac bushes right around it in bloom, so you couldn't well pick a prettier spot for your future husband's face. Mammy Lou's said we better all wear white sunbonnets, because they become you so, and Miss Merle looked awful pretty in hers with her dark curly hair. I don't know how the news that we were going to do such a thing ever got spread, for we didn't hardly tell a soul, just Mother and Mammy and Mrs. Everett and the lady they board with and her married daughter, which all promised that they wouldn't ever tell. But somebody else found out about it, as you shall see. We collected at the pasture gate at exactly a quarter till twelve, and the minute the first whistle blew we raced to the well, for we were all anxious to see our husband if he was there. They said for me to go first, as it was my well, but I said no, they must go first, because they were company. But Miss Merle said for me to look first, then she and Jean would look at the same time, as their husbands wouldn't mind reflecting together, being that they were kin. My heart was beating so that I was about to smother but I pulled my bonnet down low over my eyes to shut out any view except what was in the well, like Mammy told us to do, and leaned way over and looked. Now up to this time, my diary, whenever I have mentioned Sir Reginald, I was kinder half-joking, and never really thought he would come to pass, as so many things in this life don't, but now I believe it's so. While I couldn't make out his face very well, and don't know whether his eyes are blue or brown, and his nose Roman or not, still there was something glittering and shining in that well which I firmly believe was meant to be Sir Reginald de Beverley and his coat of mail. They were punching me and saying, Aunt, do you see anything? Till I couldn't tell whether he smiled at me or not. But I remembered my manners even on such a critical occasion, so I got up and let them look. They commenced pulling down their bonnets like I did and leaned over the well. I was on the other side, facing the lilac bushes, and in less time than it takes me to write it, me being in a hurry and my pencil short, there was something happening that made me feel like I was in a fairy tale. I saw those lilac bushes move, and the next thing I knew, there was Mr. St. John. Not in a white vest, it's true, but looking beautiful enough even in the daylight. He motioned me not either to speak or move, though I couldn't have done either one, being almost paralyzed between seeing him and Sir Reginald at the same time. He tipped up right easy and leaned over the well opposite Miss Merle. When Jean saw his image in the well, she gave one overjoyed scream and leaned farther over to see more. Oh, it's Mr. St. John, she called out to her Aunt Merle her voice sounding very deep and hollow, but joyful. It's Mr. St. John. He's going to be my future husband. He and Miss Merle were about to kill themselves laughing, for Miss Merle had seen him from the first, but when Jean looked up and saw him, he looked at her so sweet that you felt like you could forgive him anything he was to do, even the ither and nither. I'd like to accommodate you, Jean, he said, laughing and catching her hand with an affectionate look, although he's usually very timid and dignified. But the fact is, may I tell, Merle? And the way he said, Merle, sounded like a whole box of marshmallows. Miss Merle smiled at him, and then he told Jean, if she would every bit as soon have it that way, he would be her uncle instead of her future husband. I was so afraid that she would faint or die right there in the pasture that I told him I heard Mother call me and ran as hard as I could tear. She came over this afternoon to tell me all about it and was feeling strong enough to eat a small basket of wild goose plums. Oh, it was a terrible shock at first, she said, stopping long enough to spit out a seed. But the minute he said, Uncle, 
my love changed why anne an uncle is an old person almost like a grandpa anyway they've promised that i should be in the wedding dressed in a pair of beautiful white silk stockings end of chapter nine read by c j plogue Chapter Ten of the Annals of Anne by Kate Trimble Schreiber. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. It ain't any easy matter to keep a diary with a baby in the house, especially if he's at the watchable age. Although he's such a darling one that you don't begrudge him the trouble he makes. Before you more than get a sentence down, you have to drop everything and run and jerk the palm leaf fan out of his hands which he takes great pleasure in ramming the handle of down his throat then he eats great handfuls of the virginia creeper leaves if you leave him on the porch for a minute by himself and at times he won't be satisfied with anything on earth unless you turn up the mattress and let him beat on the bed springs which i consider a smart idea and think cousin eunice ought to write out and send to a magazine under the head of hints for tired mothers but i say it again there don't any of us begrudge him these many little ways although it's hard to be literary with them for when he smiles and patty cakes and says ah uh, ah uh, you don't care if you never write another line mother made cousin eunice turn over the raising of him to her the very day she got here for everybody knows my diary how a lady that's ever raised a baby feels toward a lady that's just owned one a few months no flannel on this precious child mother almost screamed the minute we got him off the train and started to drive home why it's positively flying in the face of providence to leave his band off this early and mother looked at cousin eunice like she had done it a purpose oh aunt mary please don't poor cousin eunice said like she was about to cry for the last eleven months there has been scarcely a thing discussed in my presence but belly bands there weren't any men around it seems if a woman ever has one baby her thoughts never travel away from flannel bands afterward but pneumonia cholera infantum teething mother kept on hugging waterloo close that's what twenty-three of my neighbors tell me cousin eunice answered then nineteen others say it's cruel to keep him all swathed up in this hot weather while eleven said to leave it off until his second summer and fifteen said for me to what does dr gordon say mother asked to change the subject off of the neighbors he said damn those old women cousin eunice told her which made her jump although it looks like she's lived with father long enough not to right after dinner they started up the talk again should waterloo be banded or disbanded they hadn't talked long when mammy lou came into the room holding something under her apron she looked kinder mad and dignified at mother and cousin eunice because they hadn't asked her for her say so about bands if it's entirely respectable for me to speak before i'm spoke to she commenced her voice very proud and haughty i'd like for you all to pay me some mind there's two subjects i'm well qualified to speak about and one is babies ain't i done raised a bushel basket full of little niggers let alone that one beautiful little white angel that's the pertest and sweetest of any in the state which made me feel very much embarrassed with modestness we all know that you've made a good job of anne cousin eunice said very pleasantly just to pacify her what would you suggest about little rufus these mammy lou said drawing her hand out from her apron like a man on the stage dressed in velvet does his sword and we saw a string of speckled beans job's tears mammy told the company there ain't no need to worry about bands when you got these there never has been a child that cut teeth hard from adam on down if his ma put a string of these around his neck cousin eunice was beginning to say something nice when father spoke up and asked mammy who it was that put them around adam's neck which made her mad poke all the fun you want to she said but the time will come that y'all will be thankful to me for saving these for mr rufy's baby or i'm a blue gum nigger lots of times i take waterloo over to make jean a visit which is easy on everybody 
for the folks over there love babies so that they relieve me of his weight the minute I get there and leave me and Jean free to do whatever we want to. She is teaching me what she calls artistic handwriting now, using an actress's signature for a copy. It consists of some very large letters and some very small ones, like the charts in an eye doctor's office that he uses to see if you're old enough to wear spectacles. Cousin Eunice has time now with so many folks to help tend to Waterloo to slip off every morning and go to a quiet place down in the yard with her paper and pencil and compose on a book she's trying to write. Before she was ever married, she wanted to write a book, and if you get that idea into your head, even marrying won't knock it out. Cousin Eunice says I'm such a kindred spirit that I don't bother her when I go along, too, but she has a dreadful time at her own house trying to write. She don't more than get her soul full of beautiful thoughts about tall, pale men and long-stemmed roses and other things like that before a neighbor drops in and talks for three hours about the lady around the corner's husband staying out so late at night and what her servants used to scrub the kitchen sink. I told her I knew one lady that hated so for folks to drop in that she unscrewed the front doorbell so she couldn't hear them ring, but she got paid back for it next day by missing the visit of a rich relation. Rufy and Cousin Eunice may live to be thankful for the string of Job's tears, but I reckon tonight Miss Merle and Mr. St. John wished that Job never shed a tear in the shape of a bean for they were what a grown person would call the indirect cause of a quarrel between them. It's queer that such a little thing as Waterloo should be picked out by fate to break up a loving couple, but he did, although I ain't saying that it was altogether his fault. This afternoon I took him over to Jean's, and we were having a lovely time on their front porch enjoying stories of her former sweethearts and a bottle of stuffed olives. She told me about one she had last winter that she was deeply attached to. She would see him at a big library in the city where she loves to read every afternoon. She saw him there one time and got to admiring him so much that she would go up there every afternoon at the time she knew he would be there and get a book and sit opposite him, making like she was reading, but really feasting her eyes on his lovely hair and scholarly looking fingernails. I never got acquainted with him so never learned his name, she told me, jabbing her hat pin deep down into the olive bottle like little Jack Horner. But he was always reading about the origin of the Aryan family, so I'm sure he was a young Mr. Aryan. I told her I certainly had heard the Aryan family spoken of. I couldn't remember where, but she said, oh, yes, she knew it was a swell family and that I must have read about it in the pink sheet of the Sunday paper. Then she said she had a souvenir of him, and, as I'm crazy about souvenirs, I begged her to go and get it, hoping very much that it was a miniature on ivory set in diamonds. What is it? I kept asking her, as she was trying to get her legs untangled out of her petticoats to get up and go after it. We were sitting flat down on the floor, which sometimes tangles your heels dreadfully. Finally, she got up, tearing a piece of trimming out, which she did up in a little ball and threw away, so her mother would lay it on the washerwoman when she saw the tear. Ashes, she told me, kind of whispery, after she had reached the front door, for she was afraid somebody would hear. But it gave me a terrible feeling, and I wondered how she got them away from his relations and whether she had to go to the graveyard in the middle of the night to do it or not. I comforted myself with the thought that they would be in a prettily ornamented urn, even if they were ashes, for I had read about urns in Roman history. But shucks, when she got back, it wasn't a thing, but a pink chewing gum wrapper full of cigar ashes that he had thrown away one day right in front of her as they were going up the steps to the library. Before I had time to tell her how disappointed I was, there came a picture-taking man up the front walk and asked us to let him take Waterloo's picture for some postcards. If you were pleased, you could buy them, and if you weren't, you didn't have to. But he knew, of course, there wouldn't any lady be hard-hearted enough not to buy a picture of her own baby. Nothing could have delighted us more, unless the man had said take our pictures, and June remarked that Waterloo ought to be fixed up funny to correspond with the string of beads around his neck. She ran and got a pair of overalls that belonged to the lady she boards with, little boy, and we stuffed Waterloo in. He looked too cute for anything, 
and we was just settling him down good for the picture when jean spoke up again and said oh wasn't it a pity that he didn't have any hair on his head as hair showed up so well in a picture i told her it was aristocratic not to have hair when you're a baby on your head she said shucks how could anything connected with a baby be aristocratic this made me mad and i told her maybe she didn't know what it was to be aristocratic she said she did too it was aristocratic to have a wide front porch to your house and to eat sweetbreads when you were dining in a hotel i was thinking up something else to say when the picture-taking man said hurry up there is a great deal more to this but it is so late that i'm going to leave the rest for tomorrow night anyhow maybe my grandchildren will be more interested to go on and read for magazine writers always chop their stories off at the most particular spot when they're going to be continued just where you're holding your breath so as to make you buy the next number of the magazine well in just a minute after we were talking about the hair jean said she knew the very thing her aunt merle was up on the far back porch drying her hair that she had just finished washing and had left her rat laying on the bureau she had seen it there when she went to get the ashes of mr arion she said it was a lovely rat which cost five dollars all covered with long brown hair and she said it was just the thing to set off waterloo's bald head fine so she ran and got it and we fixed it on he looked exactly like a south sea islander which you see in the side show of an exposition by paying twenty-five cents extra an exposition is a large place which makes your feet nearly kill you but the picture man said he looked mighty cute and snapped him in several splendid positions now if mr st john had just stayed where he belonged this would be the end of the story and i could go on to bed tonight without having to sit up by myself writing till the clock strikes eleven which is a lonesome hour when everybody else is in bed but mr st john didn't stay away and as all the bad things that happen are laid on fate i reckon she was the one that put it into his head to walk up those front steps and on to that porch before we noticed him for we were trying our best to get waterloo back into citizen's clothes he stopped to see what it was we were scrambling over and when he saw that it was alive he threw up his nice white hands and remarked heavens which is the elegant thing to say when you're surprised although father always says jump in jerusalem what is the thing he asked after he had looked again jean told him why it was just the lady over at our house's little baby dressed up then he asked what that horrible woolly growth on his head was which tickled jean mightily then just for the fun of seeing what he would say when he was very much surprised she jerked it off and held it up like the executioner did mary queen of scots head which gives me a crinkly pain up and down my back even to read about the rat was just pinned together and set up on waterloo's little noggin so jean jerked it off and explained to mr st john that it was her aunt merle's rat i always knew it wasn't any good idea to talk about such things before a man that was a person's lover but i thought jean had had more experience in such things than i had and it wasn't my place to interrupt her i am sure mr st john felt like saying jump in jerusalem when jean told him that the woolly growth was the rat of his beloved if i was writing a novel i'd say that he recoiled with horror that is he jumped back quickly like he didn't want it to bite him and sat down imagine he kept saying to himself like he was dazed imagine a man touching the thing kissing the thing i thought of course he was talking about waterloo and was ready to speak up and say i thank you mr st john my little cousin's not to be called a thing but jean spoke first what would you want to kiss this for she asked him tain't any harm to kiss in the mouth after you're engaged is it we might have been standing there asking him such questions as that till daylight this morning for all the answers we got out of him but while he sat looking at us and we were trying to squirm waterloo's little fat legs out of the overalls and him kicking and crying miss merle walked out on the porch she saw mr st john first as you would naturally expect an engaged girl to do and started toward him but just then she saw us and stopped 
Why, what on earth are you children doing with my rat down here? she asked, not looking a bit ashamed. We told her what we had been doing with it, and she just laughed and said, Well, it was too hot to wear the thing on such a day anyway, although she had looked for it high and low. All the time we were talking, Mr. St. John looked at her in the most amazed way, like he expected to see her appear looking like a Mexican dog, but was greatly surprised to see her with such a nice lot of homemade hair. If he had had any sense, he would admire her all the more for not telling a story about that rat, for I've seen a thousand young ladies in my life that wouldn't have owned up to it for a hundred dollars, but would have made their little niece out a story and then boxed her ears in private. I hope when I get grown I won't be a liarable young lady, although it does seem like they're twice as quick to get married as an honest one. He didn't act with good sense, though, for they soon got to talking, and we could hear what they said, although we were out of sight, for they were high-toned remarks. He said he hated shams, and she said, well, that wasn't any sham, for every blousy-headed girl wears them nowadays, and everybody knows it even the poets and novel writers that always make their heroines so fuzzy-headed. Then she called him a prig, and he said something back at her, and she gave him back the ring, which was a brave thing to do, it being a grand diamond, one with Mitzbath marked in it. Of course, the next thing that happens after an engagement is broken is for it to get mended again. All day we have hung around Miss Merle to see just when she gets the ring back again but up to late hour tonight, as the newspapers say about the election returns, there was nothing doing. Oh, it does seem a pity that they would let the news go down to their children or be put on their tombstones that their lives were blighted on account of a rat. I've neglected you, my diary, for the last few days because my mind has been on other things. It rained all the next day after I wrote last and I couldn't go over to Jean's, which put me out greatly. I finally thought about sending a note by Lares and Penates and paid them in chicken livers, me being so uneasy in my mind that I didn't have any appetite for them and knowing that they loved them enough to fight over them any time. I told Jean in the note to fix some kind of signal like Paul Revere to let me know the minute the ring got back to Miss Merle, for I was deeply worried, me and Waterloo and Jean being to blame for it. Then, too, it is dangerous for an engagement ring to stay returned too long, for it might get given to another girl. Jean was delighted with my note and said she would certainly hang a lantern in the garret, only she never could undo the chimney of a lantern to light it, and never saw a lady person that could. But it was a romantic idea. So she thought hanging a white towel in the window that faces our house for a signal would do very well and I would know by that if it kept on raining and I couldn't get over there. Well, I was so interested that I hardly moved from that side of the house all day, until it got so dark that I couldn't see the house, much less a towel. So I went sorrowfully to bed. The next morning I was delighted to see that I was going to get rewarded for my watching, for long before breakfast I discovered a white thing, and it was waving from Mr. St. John's window, which made it all the surer in my mind. Although it was cakes and maple syrup, I didn't waste much time over breakfast, but grabbed my hat and started for Jean's. Miss Merle was on the front porch, and I noticed Mr. St. John just inside the hall, looking like he would like to come out, but was waiting for her to give him leave. She looked up at me quick. Why, Anne, she said, what are you in such a big hurry about? I've often noticed, my diary, that when people are in a hurry and can't think of anything else to tell, they tell the truth, although they don't intend to. It was that way with me. Oh, I'm so glad you and Mr. St. John have made up, I told her, fanning hard with my hat, for I was all out of breath. She looked very strange and asked me, What? So I told her over again. Just then, Mr. St. John came out and asked who was that talking about him behind his back. He looked pitiful although he tried to look pleasant, too. Jean heard me talking and came running down the stairs just in time to hear me telling it over again to Miss Merle. Why, there ain't a sign of a towel hanging out the window, she told me, looking very much surprised and me greatly mortified. You must have dreamed it. 
miss merle asked her then what she was talking about and it was their turn to look surprised when she told them i told them i had felt awfully bad about the rat because me and waterloo was partly responsible and they kinder smiled but i couldn't let them think that i made up the towel story so i told them if they would come around on the side that faces our house i'd show them mr st john and miss merle looked at each other very peculiar and he said it's a shame to disappoint the children which she didn't make any answer to but she looked tolerable agreeable then i begged them to come on around to mr st john's window and i could show them i wasn't any story my window he said looking surprised then his face turned red why it must have been my uh, shirt i hung there last night to dry after i was out in that shower we couldn't help from laughing all of us but he laughs like the corners of his mouth ain't used to it that is one bad thing about a dignified man they're always afraid to let their mouth muscles stretch miss merle caught me and jean by the hand with a smile and said let's go and see what that signal looked like that brought ann over in such a hurry a shirt is a highly proper thing to discuss since thomas hood she said as we started down the steps pray don't he said the corners of his mouth wrinkling again but his face just covered with red i'll be the happiest man on earth merle if you'll just forgive me for my vicinity but do come back for it's an undershirt end of chapter ten read by c j ploke chapter eleven of the annals of anne by kate trimble sharber this librivox recording is in the public domain come on in the eggnog's fine rufie called out to us as we came up the walk to the side gate this morning a beautiful christmas morning after a long tramp down through the wood lot and up the ravine come on out the ozone's finer cousin eunice sang back at him then stopped still leaned against the gatepost and looked up at the mistletoe hanging in the trees all about you can get ozone three hundred and sixty-five days in the year eggnog but one he hollered again but i saw him set his glass down and start to swing waterloo up on his shoulder no matter how long they've been married you can always find rufie wanting to be where cousin eunice is and vice versa long ago anybody reading in my diary would have seen that mother is the kind of woman who loves to mother anything that needs it from a little chicken with gapes to a college professor out in a storm without his rubbers and the latest notion she has taken up is to see that miss martha claxton one of the teachers in a girls school that has been opened up near here shall not get homesick during the weekends we all like her mammy lou even saving the top of the churning every friday to make cottage cheese for her and cousin eunice said she knew she was a kindred spirit as soon as she said she could eat a bottle of olives at one sitting and loved baby stewart's picture so we invited her to go walking with us this morning and cousin eunice told her all about her courting in the ravine i also knew about her peculiarity which cousin eunice didn't but i didn't like to mention it for miss claxton had smashed her eyeglasses all to pieces yesterday and was wearing an embroidered waist and a string of coral so instead of looking intellectual as she usually does she looked just like other girls but the men of our family all laugh at her behind her back and call her the knocker because she carries a hammer with her on all her rambles instead of a poetry book and knocks the very giblets out of little rocks to see if they've got any fossils on their insides in other words she's a geologist a person ought not to blame her though until she has had time to explain to them that her father was professor of it and had a chair in a college when she was born so he taught her all about rocky subjects when she was little and she's crazy about it still i would rather be with a person that is crazy about geology than one that isn't crazy at all i hate medium people but as i have said we are all very fond of her although she has never done anything since i've known her that would be worth writing about in this book not having any lover so it has been lying on the shelf all covered with dust ever since jean left sometimes i think i'll never find another jean to get back to my subject though this morning was lovely cool enough to keep your hair in curl if you were a grown lady and warm enough to make your cheeks pink 
cousin Eunice said she couldn't go back into the house while the sunshine was so golden, so we leaned our elbows on the fence and Miss Claxton examined a handful of pebbles she had picked up on our walk. Pretty soon Rufy came out with Waterloo on his shoulder and in his hands a horse that can walk on wheels and a mule that can wag his head, ears, legs, and tail and say, quick, quick, all at the same time. Oh, Rufy, isn't it lovely? Cousin Eunice said, looking away toward the hills and sighing that half-sad sigh that rises in you when you see something beautiful and can't eat it, nor drink it, nor squeeze it. Isn't what lovely, your complexion? He answered, just to tease her. For Rufy loves the outdoors as much as any of us, and if Waterloo takes after his mother and father both, he will never sleep in anything more civilized than a wigwam don't joke she said it's too beautiful and too fleeting just think in another week we'll be back dwelling with the rest of the fools amid the tall buildings it is everything you say he answered soberly looking in the direction she pointed and he seemed to have that happy hurting feeling that comes to you when you look at lord byron's picture or smell lilies of the valley don't you feel light on a morning like this cousin eunice said again still looking at the hills couldn't you do anything anything he echoed even push my paper to the hundred thousand mark or carry a message to garcia especially the message to garcia now couldn't you she said with a bright smile i could do that myself without even mussing up my white linen blouse miss claxton looked up at them with a puzzled look and rufy and cousin eunice unhitched hands miss claxton rufy began with a half teasing twinkle in his eye I heard father telling him a while ago about Miss Claxton being a knocker. This little affair about the message to Garcia happened a bit this side of the Eocene age, so maybe you haven't bothered your head about it. I might explain that. Nobody asked you to, sir, she said with such a rainbow of a smile at him that I was surprised. If she could smile like that at a married man, what would she do at a single one? i know a lot more things than i look to with my glasses on that carrying the message to garcia was a brave thing to do even aside from the risks it is heroic to do the thing at hand i'm trying to learn that lesson myself i'm being a school marm and wearing glasses to look like one instead of following my natural bent in the scientific field she wound up still smiling what's your ambition cousin eunice said looking at her wonderingly Knowing what's to be known about primitive man, Miss Claxton answered, he's the only man I ever cared a copper cent about. Mine's writing a book that will make me famous overnight. I don't want to wait to awake some morning and find myself so, Cousin Eunice said, stooping over to set Waterloo's horse back up on its wheels. For he would come unfixed every time Waterloo would yank him over a gravel. And all the time we were talking, he kept up a chorus of, the court the court rufy said his ambition was never to see an editor's paste pot again and he was turning to me to ask what mine is when the conversation was interrupted i was glad that it was for i should hate to tell them just what mine is somehow it's mostly about sir reginald de beverley and i'm old enough now to know that he may not be an english lord after all and dress in a coat of mail he may just be a plain young doctor or lawyer and we'll have to live in a cottage only excuse me from a flat i wouldn't live in a flat with lord byron and maybe we'll just have chicken on sunday but as long as he has brown eyes and broad shoulders and lovely teeth i shall manage to do with crackers and peanut butter through the week a woman will do anything for the man she loves but i didn't have to tell them all this for just then we heard the gate click and saw our friend mr gale coming up the walk there comes old zephyr rufy said with a laugh it was the biggest lie on earth to name him gale even breeze would have been an exaggeration he's awfully smart i told rufy for i hate to have my friends laughed at i know you and julius joke about him on account of his gentle ways and broad-brimmed hats father says it's better to have something under your hat than to have so much style in its looks well he has something under his hat cousin eunice said and had enough to cover twice as much but i think those old-timey things are becoming to him what is the subject about which he knows so much 
Miss Claxton asked, following him with her eyes until Dilsey let him in at the front door. Heaven, Rufy answered her, and hell. He writes deep psychological stuff for the magazines, and they pay him ten cents a word for it. He must spend his dimes building model tenements, for he certainly doesn't buy new hats with them. What does he say about heaven and the other place? Miss Claxton asked, much to our surprise, for we had thought she didn't care about anything but earth. He says they're both in your own heart. The heaven side comes up when you've done a decent job at your work and loved your office boy as your own nephew. And, Miss Claxton kept on, and the hell part comes into the limelight when you've done anything mean, such as spanking your Waterloo when the telephone bell makes you nervous, not when he's bad, Cousin Eunice said, gathering Waterloo up in her arms and loving him. Him's a precious angel, and mutters a nasty lady to him lots of times. Aunt Mary is sending him out here to find us, Rufy said, as we saw Mr. Gale coming out of the dining room door. I hope she's filled him so full of eggnog that we can have some fun out of him. He had on a Sunday-looking suit of black clothes and a soft black tie in honor of the day, and was really nice-looking as he came up toward us, and Miss Claxton threw away the last one of her pebbles, no matter what they had on their insides, and commenced wiping her hands vigorously with her handkerchief. Thank goodness, I thought as I watched her, I shall go straight upstairs and wipe the dust off my diary with my petticoat. I reckon Rufy and Cousin Eunice both thought that Mr. Gale and Miss Claxton had met before, for they didn't offer to introduce them, but I knew they hadn't, so I was the one that had to do it. I had forgotten how the lady's own journal said it ought to be done, and I was kinder scared anyway, and when I get scared I always make an idiot of myself. So I just grabbed her right hand and his right hand and put them together and said, Mr. Gale, do shake hands with Miss Claxton. Well, they shook hands but the others all laughed at me. Cousin Eunice said she was sorry she didn't know they hadn't met before or she would have introduced them, but Mr. Gale smiled at me to keep me from feeling bad. Never mind, he said. I'm sure Anne's introduction is as good as anybody's. What she lacks in form, she more than makes up for in sincerity. I thought it was nice of him to say that, but I was so embarrassed that I got away from them as soon as I could. I went out to the kitchen to see if Mammy Lou was ready to stuff the turkey. Larry's and Pinati's were on the floor playing with two little automobiles that Julius had brought them. Mammy Lou was fixing to cut up the liver in the gravy. Please don't, I began to beg her. I'll go halves with Larry's and Pinati's if you'll give it to me. You don't deserve nothing, she said, trying to look at me and not laugh. I seen you out there by the side gate aggin em on. Reckon you're in your glory now that you've got a pair of em to spy on and write it all out in that pesky little book. Oh, they ain't a pair. I told her, slicing up the liver into three equal halves. They soon will be if they listen to you. Never in this world. She says she never has cared for anybody but a person she calls primitive man. Dar now, I bet he fooled her, she said with great pleasure. For next to a funeral, she likes a foolin'. And she's always excited when she forgets and says dar now. If he has, she kept on, she better do the next best thing and marry Mr. Gale. He's got as good raisin as every man I ever seen, although he's a little poor. But they's some things I don't like about fat husbands. They can't scratch their own back. I was glad to keep her mind on marrying, for I thought I'd get a chance at the gizzards, too. But she watched it like she watches her trunk key when her son-in-law's around. I told her to go to the window and see what they were doing now and she did it poor old soul when she came back the gizzard was gone but she was so tickled that she didn't notice it they've done paired off and gone down by the big tree to knock mistletoes out in the top she told me her face shining with grease and happiness i knowed twould be a match needn't never tell no nigger of my experience that folks is too smart to fall in love everybody's got a little grain of sense no matter how deep it's covered with book learning Oh, they don't have to be smart at all, I told her, talking very fast to divert her mind from the gravy. Father says if the back of a girl's neck is pretty, she can get married if she hasn't sense enough to count the coppers in the contribution box. And he told the truth, she said, stopping still, her hands on her hips, like she was fixing for a long sermon. And furthermore, if she's rich, she don't need to have neither. But marrying for riches is like putting up preserves. 
it looks to be a heap bigger pile beforehand than afterwards. And many a man marries a rich girl expectin' an automobile when he don't get nothin' but a baby buggy. Mr. Gale has been coming over so early every morning since that first morning that he met Miss Claxton and staying so late that I haven't had much time to write. I've been too busy watching. I've often heard Dr. Gordon say that diseases have a period of incubation, but I believe that love is one disease that doesn't incubate. It just comes like light does when you switch on the electricity. This morning Mr. Gale came so early that Rufy went into the sitting room and began to poke fun at him, as usual. Hello, old man, he said, shaking hands with him. I'm surely glad to see that it's you. Thought, of course, when the doorbell rang so soon after breakfast that it was an enlarged picture agent. No, I'm far from being an enlarged anything, the poor man said, wiping off the perspiration from his forehead, for he must have walked very fast. In fact, I'm feeling rather ensmalled as our friend Anne might say. I have never before so realized my utter unworthiness. Posh, Rufy said, slapping him on the shoulder in a friendly way. Why, man, you're on to your job as well as anybody I ever saw. Why, your last article in the journal for the Conoscente made me give up every idea of the old-fashioned heaven I'd hoped for, a place where a gas bill is never presented, and alarm clocks and society editors enter not. Mr. Claiborne would have been worth his weight in platinum as court jester to some melancholy monarch in the Middle Ages, Miss Claxton said, looking up from her crochet work, which Mother is teaching her and Cousin Eunice to do, because it has come back into style, to smile at Mr. Gale. I'm not what Anne calls smart, he said in answer to her, but I remember enough history to know that the other name for jester is fool. I shan't stay where people call me such names so he got up and went out, which gave Cousin Eunice and Waterloo and me an excuse to go too, so we left the lovers alone. Well, he's what I call a damn fool, Rufy said in a whisper as soon as the door was closed so they couldn't hear, coming over here every few minutes in the day toting a long face, as Mammy says, and hasn't got the nerve to say boo to a goose. Saying boo to a goose wouldn't help his suit any, Cousin Eunice said. Besides, well-regulated young people don't get engaged in three days. What ill-regulated young people you and I must have been, Rufy said, then dodged Waterloo's ball, which she threw at him, saying, What a story. It was nearly two weeks before they got engaged. I advocate getting engaged in two hours when people are as much in love as those two we've just left. Gail hasn't red blood enough in him to stain a Chagot's undershirt. Hasn't anything happened worth writing about until today, but it has been happening so thick ever since this morning that my backbone is fairly aching with thrills. And I'm tired. Oh, mercy. But I'm going to stay awake tonight until I get it all written out, even if I have to souse my head in cold water or rouse up Waterloo. Right after breakfast this morning, Mr. Gale happened to see Cousin Eunice go into the parlor by herself to crochet some extra hard stitches. And so he went in after her and said he would like to have a little talk with her if she didn't mind. Dilsey had left the window up when she finished dusting, which I was very glad to see, for I was in my old place on the porch. He told her he supposed he was the confoundest ass on earth, but she said, oh no, she was sure he wasn't so bad as that. Then he plunged right into the subject and said he was madly in love and didn't know how to tell it. Would she please help him out? Oh, I don't mind that, she answered kindly. All earnest lovers are awkward. The Byronic ones are liars. He said he knew she would understand and help him with her valued advice. But just what was he to say, and when was he to say it? She told him she thought it would be a psychological moment tonight, the last night of the year, and they would all be going their different ways on the morrow. It would be very romantic to propose then, say on the stroke of twelve, or just whenever he could get himself keyed up to it. He said, oh, she was the kindest woman in the world. She had taken such a load off his heart. He thought it would be a fine idea to propose just on the stroke of midnight. Somehow he imagined the clock striking would give him courage. Oh, he felt so much better for having told somebody. I felt that it would be a weight off my heart if I could tell somebody, too, and just then I spied Rufy holding Waterloo up to see the turkeys down by the big chicken coop. 
I didn't waste a second. Oh, Rufy, you'll be so surprised, I said all out of breath, and he turned around and looked thrilled. Mr. Gale is red bloodier than you think. Then I told him all about it. Now, aren't you sorry you called him a D fool? I wasn't really minding about the cuss word, for Rufy isn't the kind of man that says things when he's mad. He's as apt to say damn when he's eating ice cream as at any other time. Rufy was delighted to hear that it was going to happen while they were still here to see it, and he went right back to the house and planned to sit up with Cousin Eunice and see them after they came out of the parlor on the glad new year. Julius and Marcella were coming over to sit up with us anyhow to watch it in, so it wouldn't be hard to do. Well, Mother put enough fruit cake and what goes with it out on the dining table to keep us busy as long as we could eat, but along toward ten o'clock we got so sleepy, being just married people and me, that Julia said, let's run the clock up two hours. Marcella said, no, that would cause too much striking at the same time. But she said, if something didn't happen to hurry them up and put us out of our misery, we'd all be under the table in another five minutes. We were all so sleepy that everything we said sounded silly, so when a bright idea struck me, it took some time to get it into their heads. Rufy's typewriter, I said, jumping up and down in my joy. So it waked them up some just to look at me. The bell on it can go exactly like a clock if you slide the top thing backwards and forwards right fast. I've done it a million times to amuse Waterloo. They said they knew I'd make a mess of it if I tried such a thing, but I told them if they took that view of what a person could do, they never would be encouraged to try to do things. I knew I could do it. Marcella said then for Rufy to place the typewriter close up to the parlor door, and they would all go out on the front porch to keep the lovers from hearing them laugh. So out they all filed. Well, it was an exciting moment of my life when I was sliding that thing backwards and forwards and thinking all sorts of heroic thoughts, but I gritted my teeth and didn't look up until I had got the twelve strokes struck. Then I went out on the front porch right easy and sat down by the others. Julius tucked his big coat around me and we all sat there a little while, laughing and shivering and shaking, until I felt that I'd never had such a good time in my life. Then somebody whispered, let's go in. And then the unexpected happened. We heard a sound in the parlor close back of us, and the first thing we knew there was Mr. Gale raising the window that opens onto the porch, and he and Miss Claxton came over and looked out into the night. They couldn't see us if we sat still close up against the wall, and it seemed that none of us could budge to save our lives. It was a lovely moonlight night, clear and cold, that always reminds me of the night Washington Irving reached the Bracebridge Hall. I just love it. And so he put his arm around her, Mr. Gale, I mean, not Washington Irving, and his voice was so clear and firm and happy that we all knew he had been accepted. Bid good morrow to the new year, my love, he said, and kissed her on the lips a long, long time. There's been created for me this night not only a new year, but a new heaven and and a new earth she finished up softly and they closed the window down i hope she won't take her little hammer and knock on her new earth to see if it has petrified wiggle tails in it rufy said after we had filed back into the house and moved the typewriter away from the door but his voice was solemn when he said it and we all felt like puppy dogs for being out there and nobody said another word about staying up to see how they looked when they came out of the parlor. The next day, everybody made like they were very much surprised at the way it had turned out, except Mammy Lou. She looked as happy when Miss Claxton told us the news as if she had got herself engaged again. You were right after all, Mammy, Cousin Eunice told her. In spite of all Miss Claxton's scientific knowledge, she has preferred a man to a career. And shows her good sense, too, Mammy answered, her old brown face running over with smiles like molasses in the sunshine. A man's a man, I can tell you, and a career's a mighty poor thing to warm your feet against on a cold night. End of chapter 11. Read by C.J. Plogue.